The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our webinar, Design for Manufacturing and Assembly Within the AEC Industry. My name is Noreen Klinga, Channel Marketing Senior Manager in North America for Dassault System. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that although attendee phone lines are muted, if you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them at any time via the questions window located in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll address them both during and at the end of the presentation. Also, this session is being recorded and will be available on demand at 3ds.com. I'm excited to introduce our presenters. First, you'll hear from Patrick Mays, Dassault Systems AEC Business Consultant, who will discuss construction design for manufacturing and assembly, followed by Cesar Ruest, who manages DS's North American AEC Capital Projects, and who will walk you through DFMA. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Patrick Mays. Patrick, please begin. Great, thanks Noreen. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. We'll be talking about uh, design for manufacturing and assembly or DFMA as we call it for short. But I think it's helpful to um, break this down into three pieces. I think it's helpful to understand the business context that is accelerating the move towards DFMA. And I think it's important that we have a common understanding of the legacy challenges in construction uh, that we believe that DFMA will be addressing. I'm going to take um, a little break at the end of each of these parts. And um, if there are questions that have been posted as I'm talking, Caesar will review them and uh, we'll check in to make sure everybody's on track before we move to the next section. So let me um, start with the new economies. but. Um, Instead of talking about just what's happened in the past few years, let me go back um, maybe 30 years or more now and look at a, um, an example of how the industry was already changing decades ago. If we look at the elevator market, what we see is that there's a small number of manufacturers. These four contain uh, control two thirds of the global market. Um, and, you know, the oldest elevator manufacturer, Otis, has been very responsive in moving more and more into the maintenance part of this business and changing uh, how they uh, market their products. Uh, in the early 90s, when I was working on high-rise buildings in San Francisco with Trammell Crow Construction, um, they said to me, uh, just put a bubble on your drawings and say that the elevators are going to be provided by others. We're doing five buildings in San Francisco in the next two years. We plan to buy all of our um, elevators from Otis. And the reason they wanted to do that is they would get probably a 20% discount on the cost of the elevators uh, because the um, elevator manufacturer, if they know in advance that there's a demand, they can plan their manufacturing, they can re reduce their advertising and marketing cost, uh, and they can pass along that savings to an owner. Um, elevator companies make about a 25 or 35 uh, percent profit margin in the maintenance and operation of elevators, but they only make about a 10 percent profit margin for manufacturing new equipment and installing it. Essentially, these elevator companies really want to be in the operations business, but they are um, they consider the manufacturing installation a necessary evil in order to get to that business. So the priority is not on designing these elevators, it's on maintaining them. That's the kind of business they want to have, but they need to be in both. The other reason they're interested in the maintenance side of the business is the revenue is much more stable over time. In the construction industry, uh, there's always cycles. Every nine or 10 years, uh, the market falls, there's less construction activity. If you're looking for Wall Street investment, um, the investors are concerned about these sorts of cycles and what they would prefer is steady revenue that's predictable that would come from maintenance and operation. So for those reasons, 
maintenance and operation is a real focus on many building systems. So let's rethink what those might be. Let's back up for a minute and think about uh, what these new economies are that I mentioned a minute ago. The first that we've seen in the past uh, four or five years is generally been referred to as the sharing economy. And we see it in car sharing and co-living and co-working. Uh, I think all of us are familiar with Uber and Lyft as ride share. I think some of us probably know Zipcar or Flexcar. Uh, some near, someplace uh, near where you live, there's a garage and you can have multiple vehicles there and you can take what you need when you need it. Sometimes you might need a van to take a group of people someplace. Sometimes you want just a regular family sedan. Sometimes you might even need a pickup truck to uh, pick up some things at the uh, lumber yard. But you get the vehicle you need when you need it, need it and you just pay for um, the share of the car that you're using, essentially. Um, get around is the opposite of zip car. Uh, this is an idea where if you've got four or five cars and one or two of them are not used very often, you can park it on the street someplace and get around takes care of the maintenance and fueling the car and cleaning the car and scheduling uh, the use of the car. So you're now able to get income for the extra vehicles you might have. In, in all of these cases, we are uh, trying to get better utilization rates of vehicles. If we all use car sharing services, we would probably reduce the amount of cars on the road by as much as 70%. And you can imagine what impact that would have on global uh, carbon emissions and other factors, uh, such as crowding on the highways. So um, that's the area I think we probably are all familiar with. And I think some of us are also familiar with the second category of uh, co-living. Um, I, I put this into two sections. One is um, sort of vacation rentals by owner or Airbnb. Uh, that's more of a holiday temporary use. And then Ali and Collective, which are uh, slightly different than traditional apartments. Ollie's in uh, Boston and New York, and they provide space uh, to mostly young people just getting out of college. Uh, there may be some, a, a group of friends from a college who've all decided they're gonna move to the same city together, and they wanna share a flat, uh, sort of like they did uh, while they were in college. They may or may not um, want to have um, a full kitchen, uh, and they make those decisions uh, as a group what you're essentially paying for in rent is your own bedroom and your own bathroom, but your kitchen is shared, your living room is shared. If you decide you want to laundry, that's shared. But there are also services provided by the building that um, mean you might not need any of that extra space. You might use the laundry service and dry cleaning service that the building provides. Instead of having your own parking place, you might have a car share space in the building and just uh, share a car with other people. Uh, you might uh, decide that uh, you really don't want to go to the trouble of making meals. You want to go to the dining hall in the building, or maybe you want to have hot meals delivered to your own apartment. Um, the collective in Europe is a little different. Uh, it provides uh, a, a co-living situation in multiple cities. So you might be you know, one month in London and the next month in Paris and the next month in Amsterdam, but the services and preferences that you like go with you uh, as you travel. So Olive and Ali and Collective are both models of um, a new way of using space. And the other thing that's interesting about Airbnb is um, about a year ago, they decided that they would start designing their own houses as accessory dwelling units and backyards. So now they're creating a consistent brand experience uh, by providing a modular unit to go into your backyard. These kinds of things are gonna be what drives uh, the manufacturing of modular units. If we move from uh, co-living to co-working, I think we're all familiar with WeWork. Um, even though they have run into some financial difficulties, I think that something like WeWork is here to stay. Uh, it's easy to think of it as just um, office sharing or temporary office use, but I think what's important to the folks at WeWork is the data that they collect and the preferences they see. When I go to WeWork in Atlanta, I see you know, one kind of space. I see uh, the, the, the snack bar is set up a certain way. The sizes of the conference rooms are set up a certain way. The office cubicles there are actually are very, very small. Uh, I go to London, it's different. I go to New York, it's different. 
they are understanding uh, local and regional preferences in you know, diet and food, uh, in the, the use of uh, telecommunications or video conferencing equipment. Uh, they're understanding the preferences for size of meeting rooms. And that data helps them drive towards a, a, a better and better product for the customers that they're supporting. Uh, so in essentially, we're saying that the data is uh, almost as important as the asset is to a company like WeWork. On the data side, you know, we can bring this down to a very personal level. If you look at the Nest products from Google or the Ring products from Amazon, uh, whether it's a, a thermostat or a doorbell or a camera or some other device, the data collected from that device is worth more than the device itself. Um, a company like Amazon will practically give you an Echo for less than $10 with a uh, outlet to control um, because what they really care about is the data and the preferences that are collected in the process. So what I'm saying here is that uh, with smaller devices in a building, the data associated with the device is worth more than the device itself. And what I'm saying about these modular units is that the services contracts associated with them are worth more than the unit itself. If we go back to the elevator example, I can imagine a future in which elevator manufacturers say, we'll provide an elevator uh, upfront at no cost. We would just like a certain amount of monthly rent from the tenants for using that elevator. And we expect a certain amount of money for the maintenance and operations in the elevator. The entire focus, I think, will shift to services rather than upfront cost. And this really changes our OPEX, CAPEX planning for buildings. So let's move from uh, the general sharing economy to how it might impact uh, components of the buildings. And let's start with some appliances. These smart appliances today are linked to our, our cell phones. And so you might have a, a Samsung refrigerator. It might have a camera inside that can see the contents. It might have a, a way that you can um, use it as a whiteboard to make notes, to plan menus, uh, to schedule your week, a lot of different activities. Then when you're at the store, your smartphone is connected back to your refrigerator. And if you can't remember, if you need to get some milk, you just turn on the camera and you can see what's in the refrigerator. <clears throat> some of these also have barcoding systems and other types of systems that recognize the products. <clears throat> so if your phone says you want to make a certain menu for dinner, it'll let you know what's already in the refrigerator, what's in the store, and even which shelves on the store you should go to to find the products you're looking for. When my family went to the Amazon Go store in Seattle, for example, the phone uh, already had the Amazon account on it. So when they walked in, it just recognized them as Amazon Prime members. And as they picked up things from the shelf uh, and put them into a shopping bag, uh, that was automatically recognized. If they ever put anything back on a shelf, that was also recognized. It's like going to the Amazon website. The data collected is not just what you purchased and when you purchased it and other kinds of patterns, but it's recognizing the things that you thought about purchasing but didn't purchase. This kind of data, again, is very valuable. So you can imagine a shopping experience and an appliance and a portable device like a cell phone all working together to uh, create better understanding of customer preferences and re react more quickly to those. Um, a slightly different example, this is our uh, customer in Europe, Melee, that makes um, uh, washing machines. And these uh, machines do steam cleaning and uh, automatic drying all in one unit. Uh, they're very efficient. Uh, and they also have a cell phone companion. So you might be um, on public transit on the way home. You might want to start up your laundry cycle so that right when you get home, it's finished and uh, you can hang it out on a line for fresh air. This sort of uh, preferences, again, are uh, kept track of, and the way in which you use the machine is, is also stored locally in the machine, so that as new versions of the machine come out, these sort of preferences are built in uh, to know uh, exactly what's important to the customers. So let's go from sharing economy and appliances to think about uh, multiple systems in a building combined together to be like an appliance. Let's think of a bathroom pod, for example, as if it were an appliance. You know, when uh, our refrigerator is not working or we're ready for a new model, uh, someone comes and delivers a new refrigerator, picks up the old refrigerator and takes it away. 
uh, in many parts of the world, uh, there's a, a plan for those products to be disassembled. In Japan and Germany, they have uh, relationships between consumers and manufacturers. So at the end of life, uh, the manufacturer takes back the product, disassembles it, and reuses as much as possible. So imagine we started using uh, modules and buildings that way. Imagine there's a, a, a bathroom module, a bathroom pod, for example, and uh, when you're younger, maybe just a small shower is all you need. Uh, maybe after you get married, you want to have two sinks and a little bit more space and a separate uh, partition uh, for the toilet stall. Um, maybe when you have a baby, you want to switch from a shower to having a bathtub. Uh, maybe when you're older, you want to have grab bars. Instead of bringing in a bunch of uh, construction people and tearing out these parts of a building and creating a lot of waste and a lot of inefficiency, what if you just unplugged that bathroom pod uh, had it refurbished and delivered to somebody else that needed it, or had it disassembled efficiently, and then you got a new pod that was uh, appropriate for your life uh, style. This is a different idea. Instead of uh, buying these assets individually, you have a lifelong lease, and you get the product you need when you need it, and you get the upgrades you want as, it, as you uh, improve the product over time. A utility closet is another example. Uh, this one on the screen is an example, I think, from the UK or somewhere in Europe. But um, one element of this would be a smart electrical panel. And it would not only look at an individual homeowner's uh, power use in the course of a day, it would look across multiple units in a building and see patterns of the users uh, in, uh, in the entire building. And it might recognize patterns such as there's lots of daytime use of electricity uh, in this particular building. Uh, therefore, we could probably afford to put solar panels on the roof and not have to pay the extra $10,000 per unit for the battery, but there's enough daytime use of electricity that you could capture it as you need it and use it right away. So this kind of intelligence, either on an individual unit level or across an entire building, is important. And thinking of these kinds of parts of a building, like a bathroom or utility closet, as if there were appliances, is a, is a good mentality to get into. Even in older buildings, we can have an upgrade pod for the entire building. Uh, you plug in um, this kitchen and bathroom and utility closet as a single module. And on the outside, there's already a new electrical panel and a new electric meter and a new gas hookup. So it's a very simple way to take older buildings and extend their life. In any case, I think thinking of certain building systems combined together as if there were products and appliances, is a different way to think about design and a different way to think about uh, delivery. And I think you can see the implications already why this is important to DFMA. So let's move from the sharing economy to this past year with the pandemic, what I'm calling a socially distanced economy. This socially distanced economy has really just accelerated trends that we were already seeing. If you were um, in your late 80s and you were thinking about going to a retirement home, you might have changed your mind in the past year. You might have felt like um, assisted living was not really a safe environment. If you had to go in for minor uh, medical procedures, you might have decided to put that off because you weren't sure it was safe to go to a hospital or a clinic. Uh, so this context has changed how we want to receive these services. Um, all of us are on this webinar here today together and I think many of us are doing most of our business right now uh, by telecommuting. Wouldn't it be better if we had better cameras and better lighting setups, uh, better microphones and better sound quality? Um, wouldn't it be better if we had something that was what's often called telepresence as an experience for uh, an office? And many schools now are closed and kids are having to do uh, schooling from home. But distance learning is so far behind the uh, video game market or the entertainment market with special effects. Uh, what if kids got to have a really engaging experience that was a VR type experience? What if the teachers learned to use these tools and improve the quality of education for everyone? That's not our experience right now. There are not a lot of schools in which either the students or the teachers have uh, a quality experience. So I think investment in distance learning uh, after this pandemic is going to be a new priority. So let's think about products that might come from these three trends that we've seen in the past year. 
what we might see is an accessory dwelling unit in the backyard or a, a series of these modules put together into small campus type settings instead of going to a centralized very large hospital uh, maybe you go to uh, a clinic that's near a retail location and it's assembly of several modules to provide services um, and what if you could also have uh, that sort of module in your backyard you might use it as a uh, alternative to uh, a retirement home and i think you'd have a combination of wearable devices that are monitoring your health and physical devices in the space that support that It'd be a different way to have uh, consultation with nurses and doctors a different way to have prescriptions delivered a different way to keep track of whether the prescriptions are being followed correctly or not the intelligence you can build into these modules and the wearable devices can change how we deliver healthcare. So it really does call for a new product that's probably uh, a factory produced uh, module type system. Many of us these days wish we had a high quality module for our home office in our backyard. And there might be very different uses. If you're in finance or law or something like that, maybe traditional video conferencing is ad adequate. But if you're in uh, industrial design or you're in engineering, uh, maybe you need some uh, you know, 3D printing devices or some other specialty devices that are a little bit expensive. How can we uh, share these resources and create modules where folks can come together in a way that's safe and use these assets as appropriate? And finally, uh, learning modules. We've had these sorts of things for a long time, but I think we can rethink this and create a better combination of local instruction and distance learning. So that sets out, I think, some of the um, background that I wanted to give about the economy and the business context. Let me go next to ideas we've talked about for a long time, sustainable design and lean construction. And let's talk about how that's different than lean manufacturing. In sustainable design, we are aware that buildings are using 70% of uh, electricity. They're responsible for about 30% of greenhouse gases. Um, and if we produce better buildings, we can uh, create um, a more responsible um, environment and uh, a safer place for us all to live. But most of the discussions about green and sustainable ignore the fact that nearly 30 to 35% of the construction process is waste. There's no value in the final asset reflected because of the inefficiencies of the process. I don't think we can say that we're really doing sustainable design if we've wasted 30% of a building owner's budget up front in the process. So we've turned to lean construction as a solution. This is a survey we did about seven years ago. Uh, you can find it online by just Googling lean construction, smart market report. It's from McGraw Hill. And it does a survey of about 150 general contractors and subcontractors in the US to ask them about lean practices. To net it out, because this particular chart's a little confusing, only eight or 10% of US contractors seven years ago were using any real lean process that was similar to manufacturing. Most of them were using a system that is not really up to the level of manufacturing lean, but it does create slight efficiencies on the job site. And the problem is that you know these lean practitioners, even though they're less than 10% of the population, they view the construction industry, as you can see, they're saying that something like 62% of them are saying that the industry is highly inefficient. Meanwhile, the non-practitioners who really don't know much about lean, 55% of them are saying, oh, the industry is highly efficient. So that's a clear problem right there is you don't know how inefficient you are until you've seen the capabilities of other industries. If we look at productivity over the past 50 or 60 years, what you see is there's been an exponential growth in, in manufacturing and information systems uh, becoming more and more productive and more and more efficient. Even agriculture today outperforms construction. Construction, in fact, has actually fallen in productivity and not grown in productivity uh, over the past 50 years or so. If we go back to 2000, the Economist had an article then saying that about 30% of most projects were waste. When I talk to individual construction companies, what I hear is a number that's actually much higher than that. 
So I'm going to pause for a minute here and ask Caesar if we have any questions from the audience that have come in. Caesar. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, looking at the questions, we have one for the end of the session that I think would be appropriate, uh, but no other questions uh, to take right now. Uh, and just noting the time at 128. Yep, great. Thank I'm you. going to pick up the pace in this next piece. I think most of you ought to be familiar with this section about the legacy challenges. The first is that the models created by the architect, these BIM models, the fabrication models produced by manufacturers and subcontractors, and the models that are sequence models created by builders are really three different models by three different professionals uh, that are using probably three different types of software. If those were to properly be integrated, not with IFC, but full integration between them, and you created both integrated documents and drawings and integrated models, then you could connect those to cost and schedule information. If you had those five steps in place, then you could create a production control system. Unfortunately, we usually do not have this and we can't create a proper control system. To simplify this even further, let me use the example of a column. An architect cares about the cladding on the column and the clearances. The structural engineer cares about, say, the concrete uh, and the size of the beam of the column. Um, the detailer cares about the rebar inside the concrete and the contractor cares about the formwork. Is it steel? Is it wood? Uh, how much do I have and how's it set up? And the facility manager cares about uh, all of that. Well, that's five different professionals with five different software packages. And IFC and you know these sort of data exchange formats are not really going to fix this problem. We have an underlying contract problem, and we have a real structural problem in how information is shared today. So let's talk now, going from the design issues to the uh, construction issues. It's primarily about on-site congestion of trades. You know, when the structural frame of a building is ready, first the plumbers come in and put slope pipe in. Then the heating and cooling guys come in and put large duct work in. And then the electrical guys come in and put the uh, electrical lines. And that sequence follows, and each trade has to wait in, in, uh, to the trade in front of them is out of the way until all the stored materials are out of the way. So that sequencing is a big uh, issue around inefficiency in construction sites. If we move to prefabrication and we put all that together, we create for ourselves potentially a new problem. How large is that uh, module? And how do we lift it and place it? And does the factory's output really balance out to the construction site's ability to absorb those components? As we said with elevators, the real opportunity is in operations and maintenance. And we haven't broken these large modules into smaller components that could be either replaced or maintained in a much more efficient way. So our current process for thinking about construction delivery is a little bit out of whack compared to manufacturing. You know, if we look at a factory, uh, like the slide on the, the picture on the right, I think this is probably a Tesla factory, one of our customers. Uh, and we look at the uh, image on the left, um, this is not that exaggerated, the hand tying of rebar compared to the quantity of automation in a factory. Imagine the quality control and the uh, productivity you get in these different environments. I'm not saying that we need to go to all automation. I just think that it points out how extreme the difference is right now. In a time when we have a shortage of skilled labor, we're not doing the things we need to do to make up for that shortage and enable less skilled workers to provide, uh, to uh, do more complicated tasks. If we look at the left side here, we see that this excavator, which is digging out in the corner here, it, until it's finished with this excavation, all that stored material cannot be placed. Uh, we can't continue with the piles and the sheeting and the shoring. All of that has to be done on site, and that'll be true forever. However, uh, there's much of the building after it comes out of the ground that can be done in a modular fashion. If you look at the uh, scale of the uh, factory on the right, you can see this worker in the blue uniform down here and another worker here, and you can get the sense of scale here. This is a high-speed carousel. It, it, it contains about same amount of concrete as three concrete trucks. And it's being fed down here to this gantry, which has the equivalent of a 3D printer. It's uh, uh, carefully placing concrete, and you can see how it's left out that corner. Uh, it places exactly the right amount in the right place. So instead of dumping a big batch from a truck and having workers spread it out, this device is already spreading it out. 
And this table here is a vibrating table that automatically levels out the concrete. And it has an automatic screening system that goes over the top. So just these two workers are able to produce dozens and dozens of these slabs much more efficiently than a crew in the field. This product in this case has uh, rebar exposed on the top so that uh, you can make a choice about whether you want to run the tubing for the water system, the radiant heating systems in the factory or in the field. But these slabs are also uh, done this way, as I'll discuss later, because they, the lifting weight and the transport weight are an issue. When I talk to a lot of construction companies and I ask if they have a factory, they say yes, but when I go and visit, I actually see something sort of like this picture on the right. This is really just workers indoors. It's not a really um, automated or efficient factory, uh, factory from the point of view of either lean practices or automation. Now, I'm not saying it's bad. I think it does give you probably a 10% enhancement in productivity. And it's good for the workers. They're not wearing hard hats or heavy winter jackets. The tools are readily at hand. The lighting is good. Uh, it's climate control space. They can work two shifts if they need to. But you see that there's a group of workers adjacent to each one of these bathroom pods. And so the workers are moving from pod to pod, and there's lots of people in there doing this. This is not even as efficient as the Ford manufacturing was 100 years ago with moving assembly lines and gantry cranes. So I think you could add lean practices and do a little bit better, but without auto automation, you're still going to have a problem. The other thing to think about is, you know, these bathroom pods are what we call volumetric modules. And this example on the left is a volumetric module, which is one third of an apartment unit being placed. Well, if you're shipping this on a truck, that's a lot of air and wasted space that's being shipped uh, around the highway. So you've got to rethink about what is the product and how is it made. So let's look at some examples of automation. Let's focus on concrete for a minute. Uh, on the right is a um, machine that creates a, a spiraled uh, rebar for columns. And on the left is a machine that produces beams. And you can see in the black cage in the background here, these coils of rebar. Now that's an important factor because those only come in coils up to a certain gauge. When the, when the rebar gets thick enough, it only comes a straight bar and it has to be hand tied. It can't run on these machines. What I'm saying is that you've got to understand each workstation in the factory. What's the capacity of the kiln? Uh, what's, what's the size of the tilting table? What's the capability of the welding machines? Uh, you, have to, you have to understand each station and how to use the station to best advantage. So here's a typical scene in the back of a factory where you've got these coils waiting to go into the machine and be refed. And that's one of the things we can think about differently as engineers. So here's a typical rebar welding machine. They also make these that tie rebar. It's being fed by a spool. Um, and so right after this machine is another machine that folds the sheets into certain shapes. So you can create a double T or a special uh, curb condition on your slab. Well, that folding machine can fold in certain directions, but not others. And this machine can weld bars of uh, sheets of a certain width, but not beyond that width. And it can handle certain links pretty well, but other links not so well. Understanding the limitations of the equipment is really important in the design. And too often, we don't know that until we have already uh, gotten into mid-construction and have hired on the subcontractors and manufacturers making these things. I'm going to skip this, but this is uh, MEP systems, whether you do them as skid in the field or in the factory. And this is the point I made earlier of how much is it going to be volumetric and how much of it is going to be panelized. So here's a, an example of a digital content library. Uh, and three ways you could think of this double T slab. The width of the slab might be determined either by the width of the truck or the width of the uh, rebar uh, sheet welder. Uh, the thickness might be determined, uh, might determine the weight and whether it's going to be um, uh, multiple slabs on the truck or only a few slabs on the truck. It might have to do with whether you have a, a single tower crane or you want to use mobile cranes that have less, less lifting capacity in conjunction with the tower cranes. And then finally, the length of this double T might be based on the uh, bed of the truck. If it's too long or too wide, this truck has to be escorted and can only be on the highway certain times of day. So that's an impact on logistics. So you can see uh, there's a logistics factor, it's a manufacturing factor, 
and there's an understanding of equipment that's involved in making these decisions. Architects and engineers are generally not aware of these issues and they're not built into the design. So it's like we have to design the building twice. Uh, the first time we design it for a permit, and the second time we design it for how we plan to make it. So let me pause again uh, and see if uh, Caesar has any questions that have been collected. Uh, no, but the, the, the there was a comment about how thought provoking everything's been, Patrick, so far. So I think you're on the mark. Uh, and uh, but no other questions other than that comment. Okay, so I'm going to try to get through this last uh, section in about uh, 10 minutes, so we have enough time uh, for some questions. So if we look at our current uh, AEC process, uh, this is defined by the AIA in the U.S. or RIBA in uh, the U.K. Um, we start with a, a program. Uh, the owner has defined exactly what they want and exactly what kind of uh, budget they're interested in. There's a conceptual design based on that. And the schematic design is enough for us to get initial um, reviews by permitting and zoning uh, folks to make sure the project is feasible. Um, this type process, I think, presumes that we only move forward and not backwards. It's from schematic to design development to construction drawings, and then there's a bidding phase, and there might be a few changes, but that's never true. Uh, what happens is there's constant changes throughout the entire life here. And this process that we've set up for ourselves as a design process, I think is problematic in a couple of ways. If we compare it to industrial design, it's a very, very different process. Uh, industrial designers almost work like anthropologists. They are studying be, uh, human behavior and they get a customer who says, we're interested in changing behavior in the following ways. We'd like somebody who's shopping in a store to use this grocery cart or this product in a slightly different way. What do we need to do to change their behavior? So an industrial designer looks at the user experience, the user interface. Uh, they do research on behavior. Uh, and this industrial design process is an iterative process of brainstorming. And out of it comes two, three prototypes that seem to be viable. But those physical prototypes then are put out into the field and tested. And in fact, do they change uh, behavior? Do they change the outcome or not? And from that, you choose one that's better than the others, uh, creating the result you're looking for. And then you get into formative testing. Should it have an, uh, a, an aluminum shell or should it have a plastic shell? Uh, what should the weight be? Uh, should we outsource the circuit boards? You know, how do we actually make this thing? Once you know what it is and what the materials are and how you plan to make it, you still have to get into production design. Do we make everything ourselves or are some of the subcomponents going to be made by others? You know, how do we plan the logistics and the supply chain and the manufacturing process? When all of that's done, you create a final version of the product for some period of years sometimes, and you put all that together. That is completely different than how we design buildings. And I think we've really got to th start thinking of buildings not as a single project, but as subcomponents that are in fact products that should use this sort of industrial design uh, thinking and how they're made. So let's look at what's the state of the art maybe in modular design for buildings today. This is a volumetric module. Uh, this uh, is a unit on a truck and it takes about uh, three of these modules to make uh, a living space, uh, a one bedroom apartment. And then it would take probably four modules to make a three bedroom apartment. Uh, so this is shipping quite a lot of air, uh, and that's one challenge. The other is uh, this company has decided to do this as a self-supporting system. So to have is a heavy gauge steel structural frame, and then it has light gauge metal for the uh, demising partitions inside, and it has a specialty system for the kitchen and for the bathroom pods and other things. So that's the uh, product that this company makes. And they make some other products that are the hallways between units and some of the public spaces. <clears throat> when a company like this looks at a building, uh, they have this sort of color coding from you know, green to blue uh, of things that they're really capable of doing well with the modular delivery. And then yellow and orange and red are the things that they do less well. So they might even split the contract and say that the excavation or even this podium that's a parking garage and the core uh, elevators and stairs are actually all provided by another construction company. And then they come in and in green, they're doing the facade system. And in blue, they're doing these modules for the units. 
they are trying to optimize what they can do best with DFMA and not take on the entire project. It's not often the case that you're going to build the entire building with a DFMA process, but you can certainly do 70 or 80% of a building uh, for certain building types. Now let's compare uh, what we see as modular delivery and DFMA in the construction industry to even something from 20 years ago from Citroen Peugeot. Um, our newer customers like Volkswagen um, and Toyota and Scania trucks and buses are using systems uh, significantly more sophisticated than this, uh, but uh, some of that's uh, proprietary information, so I can't really share it. But I think you'll get the concept even from these older systems. The idea here is that uh, they want to be able to create 80% uh, of a product of a vehicle from either fixed or scalable parts, the red and the uh, green parts that are shown here. And they can make you know four or five different products. They can make a family van, they can make a hatchback, they can make a sports car, they can make a small coupe. <clears throat> they can make a lot of different vehicles just with this one platform. And so what is that platform? It starts with a key fixed uh, component, which you know, back in those days, it had to do with the chassis. These days, it's actually broken at the firewall, and there's a back chassis and a front chassis and a firewall system. But there's a, a limited amount that has to do with the drivetrain and the chassis that are fixed systems that all of these vehicles can be built on. But on top, the scalable systems, like the body of the car or the interior of the car, um, those are much more adjustable, uh, but there's parameters that drive it. So the customized pieces, the sunroof, especially bumpers, these kinds of things, uh, those are actually paid for as extras by uh, the final consumer. And so the additional cost is not really a concern. They're controlling quality uh, and they're controlling um, the cost by manufacturing around a modular system. And when they say platform and they say module, uh, they don't mean a volumetric module that fits in the back of a truck. They mean multiple systems bound together and, and supplied by someone in a supply chain uh, and that, are, that go to a final assembly location. Now, whenever I bring this up to construction people, they always say, well, you know, uh, cars are making, you know, tens of thousands of cars that are all the same and it's high production and it's a small thing. Well, you know, here's Meyer Werft, one of our customers making uh, luxury cruise liners for uh, Carnival and others. And they produce these in about 18 months. Uh, and uh, so from the day the contract is signed, 18 months later, this ship is in port. Uh, the crew is on board and trained. Uh, all the linen and food and uh, consumable materials are on board. And they're ready to take on passengers. That precision in delivering high quality exactly on time is really quite different than the experience in construction. And this ship is every bit as complicated as any building we might build. It's a five-star luxury hotel with movie theaters and concert halls. It has sports facilities. It has uh, all kinds of things that are equal to or better than what you'd expect in any building. And yet it's produced in a very different way. So let's go now and talk a little bit about a, a production uh, control system um, and um, how we do engineering simulation. You know, the starting process is really a fabrication level solid model. And putting that onto a PLM platform or an object, da object data environment so we can do many things with it. So, you know, today we tend to think of some BIM model here in front of this, and we have to convert that uh, not very smart BIM model into a fabrication model. I would suggest we ought to think about this the other way around, that many building components, if we think of these as uh, products, whether it's a bathroom pod or a fire stair or something like that, that we actually create the um, fabrication model first and provide content back to the BIM user and ask them to work from a standard library. As I gave an example earlier with the double T slab, that's a content library way of driving design. Uh, this is what we would call configure to order as opposed to bespoke custom design. So now that you've got this solid model, what do you do with it on a PLM platform? Well, you'd want to get a construction bill of materials out of this engineering bill of materials. 
you'd want to get the work breakdown structure. And you're starting to think now about the sequence of these parts and how they go together and the scheduling and timing of these things. But you're also thinking about logistics. Uh, am, am I using trains, trucks, or ships to deliver this with? Uh, what kind of cranes and lifting devices do I have on the site? Is the factory producing parts too quickly? Do I need to have a buffer zone at the factory, a lay down space at the job site, or a buffer zone in between? Um, what's the factory set up for? What am I doing myself and what am I outsourcing? And how's the uh, 4D planning on site uh, for consumption going to be balanced against the factory output? These three factors, number four, five, and six, logistics, factory production, and on-site uh, installation, are the critical factors that have to be simulated over and over to optimize it. And that's what informs the design, not the other way around. And finally, what we want to have is good work instruction and a safe environment for workers. So I'm going to run through the last two slides very quickly. This is an example in London where we had uh, Norman Foster's Revit files that were put onto our platform and managed uh, to break down the sequencing. We looked at the, uh, the labor, we looked at the ergonomics of the workers, we looked at the equipment, we looked at the uh, temporary supports that were needed, and we simulated all that to figure out the best way to use the factories and the best way to use the job site. So finally, execution control. This is the simplest version, uh, full-scale mock-up in the field. Uh, this is the US Olympics Museum. And this is McGrath that's making this uh, uh, architectural metal facade for the building, including the glazing systems. But we also have a virtual model. We have a parametric model that can account for changes as they accumulate. And how do we check that? Well, we have to do 3D scanning of the building as it comes together. These diagonals we see are probably temporary bracing. These horizontal lines we see are probably safety lines. But as the panels are put in place, we can discover that there are accumulated areas. So we can report back to the factory that the new panels being produced have to make up for uh, the accumulated error on the panels being installed. So that's kind of the sequence of it. We have to have a logistics control system. We have to know the individual trades on site uh, and the sequencing of those trades. We also have to have sequencing for materials. In this case, it's uh, these temporary um, props that hold up these walls so that concrete can be poured into them. And finally, we have worker sequencing, and then we have worker safety. Those are the goals we're shooting for. It's completely different than the 4D tools we have today. And it's a balance between optimizing factory production, field consumption, and creating a collaborative environment so everybody can see the results. So let me see if I have enough time left. Uh, Caesar, have we got time for a few questions, or do we need, need to go straight to your presentation? Uh, I think we can cover off the questions just towards the end. Well, I'll, my piece should only take about five minutes uh, or okay. less. Yeah, I think uh, we've got a, the question bottle had become uncorked. <laughs> and we took a few. We took a few questions. You really hit some uh, hit some points. Right. Let me take two or three, and then I'll uh, turn over the presentation to you. Sure. And we can answer some more at the very end. Sure. Uh, one of the things was, what's the difference? You know, go back and explain a little bit between uh, shipping volumetric unit versus a bathroom pod. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what's the difference? Basically, that person was saying the ship. It's more than just shipping of air. It's it's about shipping content. So yes. what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think I've seen companies do all panelized and all volumetric, and I don't think either of those work out well at the end of the day. The way you make a decision is the number of trades that are going to be in a congested space. So bathroom pod makes a lot of uh, sense because you've got every trade going into that small space. Now, if you look at a company like Katera, they have a very clever way of making their bathroom pods and the the uh, towel bars and all the accessories are already packaged up and put into the tub and there's work construction right there. So the pod is dropped, the workers go in, they know how to remove all the packages and complete the entire bathroom very efficiently, drastically reducing the number of trades that go into there. And more importantly, they're doing the skilled uh, trade labor offsite, not onsite. They're, they're doing the onsite work with less skilled labor. Now, uh, the rest of these systems from Conterra are often panelized systems. So they're doing a hybrid of panelization and volumetric together. And with the panelized systems, you would use those for uh, living rooms and bedrooms and those kinds of spaces that don't have a lot of uh, plumbing and electrical special requirements. Uh, but you would pre-thread the walls with the conduit for the electrical. Uh, you might have uh, chases or soffits for the heating and cooling system. 
But I think there's got to be a balance between those two systems. It's not one or the other. Does that answer the question, Caesar? I think it does. I think it does. So let's pop over to uh, my screen if uh, we could. Okay. That way there we can get things uh, wrapped up and answer a few more questions. <clears throat> So everybody should be able to see my screen by now. And, uh, you know, this could be a new topic for many of you. So that's why I'm saying welcome to DFMA. Uh, I'm broadcasting from sunny Toronto. Uh, it's just like a summer day here. Very fantastic. Um, for everybody that's in the audience, you know, it's fair to say that DFMA, what Patrick's talking about is for all of the stakeholders listed on the screen. And in conjunction with those stakeholders, when you think about your own business, think about your own business inside of this orange box. You are a company. You have possibly some individual business lines. There could be subcontractors that you relate, with, relate to or work with, designers and clients. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about, uh, as far as my portion of the presentation, it's to introduce to you how Dassault really fits into the world of uh, design for manufacturing. At the heart of what AEC is all about, we have our platform. And I can say from all of my career experience, the AEC platform in Dassault is the best kept secret. Uh, it's called 3D Experience. That's the name of the platform. And for a business or business lines found in this orange box here, accessing the platform is a simple click away. And that compass really is the portal for secure and indexed data. Uh, that's a big, big difference to how you may be rolling out projects today, which could be file-based. Uh, think of it as secure and indexed data and the ability to access the data at any given point in time. Just like when you would go to Google and you would type in your search engine that you're looking for something, our platform works in the very same way. You search the engine of your data and that becomes now your mechanism to uh, helping to re-encompass any information that is in past projects, recapturing that knowledge. So at 3ds.com, uh, this is to int introduce to you the fact that our 3D experience platform does actually serve multiple industries. Uh, no surprise, uh, we're very heavy inside of aerospace and defense and manufacturing context for cars and automobiles. But when you go to 3ds.com, you'll find your AEC categories in these two buckets energy and materials, which hosts a lot of plant and process. Uh, and then you have your mainstay AEC uh, within construction, cities and territories. So these are the categories that you would click to when you go to 3ds.com. Um, one of the things though, is that everybody's doing their day job today, but really what I'm referring to here is that we want to bring more value, uh, you know, BIM plus, uh, this is really is a conversion of a digital twin experience. Uh, you can see that inside of that, that video that's playing, you are staying in the same platform all the time to do all kinds of different aspects to your role or for the company's roles. So each player that you're working with today, you are doing your job today, but you may be doing it in silos. The goal of the platform is to bring everybody together uh, it's not to lock anybody out, but ask questions like, how was it designed? And get, get, her, get to better understand how it was designed. Uh, which, getting to DFMA, you really need to increase the level of detail uh, so that you can better understand how you can fabricate it, how you can manufacture it, and then how you can build it or assemble it. So everything that you're talking about from Patrick's side is all about enhancing the detail. And in the end, how can we monitor and service it? That is like right in line with what Patrick was saying, uh, getting service revenues rather than just providing, you know, architecture or engineering at a minimum. Uh, the compass really is uh, that gateway. This is what you as a user would see if you joined the 3DS platform. You would have uh, different views for your different roles and responsibilities. Uh, the the example of a, you know, a VDC, virtual design and construction person, might wanna have multiple views within a dashboard setting, which they can then customize. But the whole goal here is all of the model data, all of the textual data, you can always search through this one tool here to 
uh, regurgitate or reuse a lot of your knowledge that was captured from project to project. That would be one of the biggest challenges that you would that you would see today is your knowledge reuse is probably very very low. And if you're trying to rebuild a ship, kind of like the example with Patrick said, you would want to be able to reuse the content over and over inside of each of these projects. And this is where knowledge reuse is king within the platform. And the delivery is always going to be tied back to the geometry. This is 3D, 4D, 5D, and so on. Uh, but project performance is really one of the great uh, areas to which you can leverage the platform at an executive level. In the end, um, I'm going to skip over this slide here, but this is one of the captivating pieces when I, when I speak with contractors is, is talking about work package, planning to execution. Uh, this could be your very starting point down that path of design for manufacturing. So essentially, reaching out for DFMA, think of yourself as a stakeholder, one stakeholder amongst your entire stakeholder team. And this includes your delivery partners. You want to think modular, possibly, like the McGrath with the skin, which almost looked like snake skin on that building. Uh, or it could be at the assembly level, uh, th rethinking about how walls, doors, and windows kind of come together uh, as a kit of parts. Uh, we're thinking about continuous integration of data. Uh, one of the things overall, though, uh, that I really want to hit, uh, hit home with is uh, as a member of Dassault responsible for North America, I'm proposing to you an opportunity to take, a, take into account an ecosystem project pricing. So I'm highly incentivizing our project pricing software for you, uh, or we could actually talk to you about a goal-based project engagement. If you have a goal without even buying software applications, you could work with Dassault Systems to actually perform parts of your projects together. So that being said, um, it was a short and sweet for me, but we are at a questions and answers time. Uh, please feel free to copy and contact me directly at caesar.ruest at 3ds.com. You can do a screen capture of it or uh, my phone number there, I'm based in Toronto. So let me go back to see what our other questions are. Um, there was one question that I wanted to also field for, uh, there was somebody from the audience that asked, what are some of the AEC tools and technology that Dassault offer? Uh, first off, we start with the platform. That is your cloud-based entry point. Uh, Dassault has reprogrammed other tools to run specifically on the platform. So for AEC, uh, developing a high level of fabrication detail to import Revit files, that will be our Katia brand product. Uh, to do a lot of the manufacturing simulation that you saw Patrick talking about, that incorporates our Delmia, D-E-L-M-I-A products. And then we have additional project products which also deal with project management, uh, sourcing out RFPs and responding to RFPs. Uh, so we have a very wide portfolio of products, but my key message to you is to remember that all of our products that drive AEC production were reprogrammed so that they can run on the platform for your project delivery. Uh, Patrick, I do have one question for you, and this was the very first question that came in. Um, and this just very pointed, generalized, Jason, in, is a question I'm gonna try to interpolate. Prior to the shipment, how would companies complete uh, the assemblies so that they do meet various energy, life, or safety uh, applications? Uh, you know, I think it's meeting like code compliance and, and such. So it could be, it could mean that the question is prior to shipment, is there a way, is there a way that you've seen of people testing and sampling, uh, the, you know, sampling the systems before they're shipped? I think it's to ensure quality control. Uh, sure, sure. But, so that's, you know, it depends on the jurisdiction, you know, uh, Title 24 in California creates certain requirements, uh, requirements in the UK and Germany, quite different again. But in whatever jurisdiction you're in, uh, you would be testing things like the uh, performance of the exterior wall, uh, module by module. Uh, in the same way in the past, we would have created a, a larger scale assembly. Um, 
some types of buildings are more stringent. For example, some of the hurricane testing in Florida requires a, a full section of facade, three floors. So you just stack the three modules and do that sort of air testing. Um, in some ways, the testing's not a lot different, but in, instead of uh, doing it from um, what you might call stick built pieces, you're taking these uh, factory panels and uh, putting them together in the necessary size for a fire test or wind test or a moisture test, any of those kinds of testing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'll take one more question here at the end. We're at 2.03. My apologies for running a little bit late. Um, does 3D Experience Platform connect to Revit, Tecla, or other BIM software, or does it have its own? Uh, the question to all, of, or the answer to that is yes. Yes, we we bring stuff in. We read all kinds of file formats, like IFC, as well as um, different uh, file formats, and we do have CATIA. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, so uh, IFC is native to our platform, uh, but you can think of our platform as a glue to hold everything together. Um, some uh, companies produce better IFC than others. You know, if you use uh, ArchiCAD or Tecla, very high quality IFC, we can either work with their files directly or through IFC. Uh, Revit does a, a fair job on a single round trip with IFC, but after that it accumulates errors. So we have a partner who has access to our API and Autodesk API, and they do a direct two-way connection between Revit and our platform. Uh, this way that uh, Revit user has in their uh, menu ribbon, uh, they, they can load the latest version or they can see that somebody else has made a change and that they need to incorporate that change. It's two-way communication between uh, multiple other softwares like uh, Tecla or Bentley uh, back to Revit. So the API level integration is better and we have partners that do that for us. And as Caesar said earlier, if you uh, are concerned about learning the software yourself, our partners will provide the services and do the work for you, uh, whatever works best for you. Thanks, Patrick. Noreen, I'll turn it back to you for closing. Sure. Um, thank you both, Patrick and Caesar. And as you mentioned, our hour is up. And so I'd like to thank you for your time and expertise today. If for any reason we didn't get to your question, we'll follow up with you directly. Um, to learn more about DFMA in the construction industry, as Caesar had said, his email is right here, shown on the screen. Um, at the close of this webinar, you will take uh, you will get a survey about um, that will allow us to get some feedback regarding the information presented today. And um, if you can fill that out, it'll assist us in providing additional webinars on topics relevant to the AEC industry. Once again, this presentation has been recorded and will be available on demand. Thank you so much for joining, and this concludes our webinar. <laughs>